This week, we interview Andrew Hay, Director of Research for OpenDNS. Stories of the week will include Adobe Flash Zero Days, Hackers Gone Free and Wild, and a hacking team that got hacked. All that and more, so stay tuned. Broadcasting live from G-Unit Studios in Rhode Island, the show where exploits run wild, packets aren't the only things getting sniffed, and the cocktails flow steady. It's Paul's Security Weekly. This week's episode is sponsored by NetSparker, the developers of the only false positive free web application security scanners, enabling you to automatically identify vulnerabilities and security flaws in all your websites, web applications, and web services. NetSparker scanners are available in two editions, NetSparker Desktop and NetSparker Cloud, the enterprise-level online scanning service. For more information, visit their website, netsparker.com forward slash security weekly. And by Pony Express. Check out the Community Edition and turn your Nexus 7 into a lean, mean pen testing machine. For all those hard to reach places, there's Pony Express. Visit them on the web at PonyExpress.com. And Bionapsis, the leading provider of solutions to protect ERP systems from cyber attacks. Customers can secure their SAP and Oracle business critical platforms from espionage, sabotage, and financial fraud risks. Visit them on the web at Onapsis.com. Now, fire up a packet capture, pour yourself a beer, and give the intern control of your botnet. Here's your host, a man who doesn't read fortune, but he's eaten a lot of their cookies. It's Paul Asadorian. <laughs> Welcome, everyone, to this edition of <laughs> Security Weekly. As uh, Jack was saying, I am your host, Paul Asadorian. I am very happy to be here this evening. We've got a whole cast of characters. We've got the Brady Bunch on Skype. Well, let's start with the Brady Bunch on Skype. Mr. Larry Pesce is there in the shadows. Welcome, Larry. Yes, yeah. Sorry, I'll turn on some light here as soon as it's I okay. figure out how this one works. It's all right. But, uh, Broadcasting from an undisclosed location. Yes, uh, somewhere near Washington, D.C., while currently doing SANS evals. Nice, nice. <laughs> Mr. Carlos Perez is here with us. Welcome, Carlos. Hey, Paul. Happy to be here. Uh, Carlos is always very focused. Uh, Carlos, you said you uninstalled your video drivers. I, do I want to know? No. Okay. Good. <laughs> not, <laughs> not Kevin is here with us. Welcome, Not Kevin, to the show. Ah, thank you, Paul. Good to be here. Mr. Joff Thayer is here as well. Welcome, Joff. G'day, Paul. Great to be here on a lovely Thursday evening again. Oh, yes. Yes, it is. Mr. Michael Santarcangelo is here as well. well got it on the first try. And I haven't even been drinking. <laughs> wow. I mean, I had a, a beer with lunch. Point. I don't think All that, right, does well, that count. All right, well, we're in for a show tonight, then. I'm that's, ready. That's right. That's right. <laughs> uh, here in studio, Mr. Jack Daniel. It's here to my oh, right. Hey. Welcome, Jack. Hello. And Mr. Apollo is here with us. And Paul's going to be know. mixing some drinks later. I'm very excited. I think we have all the right ingredients now. So we have the egg whites. We have uh, the lavender. We're good. I have. E I have. E there's eggs in there. Did you see that? I oh, brought yeah. actual eggs. Is, is you're going to use the egg whites or the yolk or? We're going to do the whites. So we're not just okay. doing a Boston. We're not just doing a whiskey sour. We're doing it Boston style. Boston Bo style. Boston. Boston. Style. I like what it. What is? Uh, so you're delayed on the Southeast Expressway due to construction, <laughs> and the MBTA is running late. How do you get that flavor into a drink? We'll yeah. get it. We'll, uh, I'll it's get it plenty to you. of bitters, or at least bitterness. Right, is there some make... wicked pizza in it? Yeah. Oh yeah, yeah wicked, wicked pizza. pizza. <laughs> <laughs> Methane and that exhaust, almost... Jack. Methane and exhaust. <laughs> that almost sounded <laughs> like a, that, that almost sounded like the beginning of a country song there. Yeah. Very good. Played <laughs> on the yeah, yeah etc. A uh, couple of quick announcements. Ready to learn combat firmware analysis? Check out my Black Hat course titled Embedded Device Security Assessments for the Rest of Us, a two-day class hosted at Black Hat Las Vegas. Your registration fees include breakfast, lunch, access to the Black Hat, briefings, business hall, sponsor workshops, sponsor se sessions, and arsenal talks. Visit securityweekly.com forward slash IOT to register today. Larry is also teaching SANS 617 Wireless Ethical Hacking and Defense coming up in Las Vegas, uh, September 14th through the 19th, Larry, and lots more places, so make sure you check out the SANS website for more course offerings. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, I'd like to introduce our first and only special guest of this evening, other than all the rest of us, which are, we're all special in our own way. Um, the bumper sticker set. Yeah, that's right. And Andrew, Andrew is special as well. Andrew's the director of research for OpenDNS, where he leads the research efforts for the company. Prior to joining OpenDNS, he was the director of applied security research and chief evangelist for Cloud Passage. Prior to that, 
Andrew served as a senior security analyst for 451's research and enterprise security practices, providing vendors, private equity firms, venture capitalists, and end users with strategic advisory services. We hope to get some of that strategery, including competitive research, new product, and go-to-market positioning. We'll talk about (laughs) positioning as well, uh, and a lot more other stuff. He's on Twitter at Andrew Andrews M. Hey, Andrew, welcome to the show. Hey, Paul, how you doing? I should say welcome back to the show. This is your second uh, appearance, I believe, on the show. Third, I think. Is it third? Yeah, third. Or you're just a veteran. You're just a veteran. Yeah. So, Andrew, tell me, what, what's it been like to uh, kind of go through some of these transitions uh, in your career? And, and how did you end up uh, at OpenDNS? Uh, it was kind of a long and windy road. Uh, probably the, the first time that we spoke or the first time I was on the show was probably when I was still in Bermuda working yes. at the bank uh, that everyone was extremely jealous of until I told them how it wasn't as great as they thought it was. Uh, then I moved back to Canada to the University of Lethbridge. I was there for, I think, eight months and then got a call and became an industry analyst. Uh, I had to trade in my heart and my soul mm-hmm. and uh, became an analyst. So how how long ago were you an analyst, Andrew? Uh, that's a good question. I think it was three and a half, four years now. Gotcha. Uh, it all kind of runs together. Yeah, a, a lot's changed in three or four years. So I I don't know. Can we talk about analyst type type stuff? Sure. Um, so what, for enterprise security, what, uh, what are some of the things when like your friends from enterprise security come up and they ask for recommendations on what's hot for the latest techniques in enterprise security? You know what? Probably the biggest difference is that nobody's asking anything to do with compliance anymore, which is kind of nice. <laughs> like they're saying, you know, I've got the, I have this PCI checkbox to, to really nail what can I get to figure, you know, <laughs> what can I get to fool the auditor that's going to come in here? Uh, that's just not the case anymore. I think a lot of that low hanging fruit's been taken care of over the years. So, do but you now, think? Yeah. Do you think that compliance um, people are getting it right and able to do compliance better, or do you think they've realized that compliance isn't security and they're moving on to greener pastures? Uh, well, I would never agree with the former, and I think it's definitely the latter. Uh, I. Honestly, I think that most organizations have purchased all the products that they need for regulatory compliance or, you know, that kind of a blanket statement, but the majority have. So a lot of organizations now that have covered those bases are looking at better technologies and uh, more skilled individuals to come in or skilled teams to come in and actually make them secure or take those those checkmark type boxes and see if they can wield them to do something above and beyond just compliance. Yeah, it's interesting, Andrew. The the job that um, you uh, had at 451 is somewhat similar to what what I do now, uh, actually at at Tenable. So, um, it's not what Ron tells me. Yeah. <laughs> Well, you know. Um, so in terms of uh, enterprise security, uh, what is your feeling on um, the uh, status of agents being installed on systems? It's kind of like an area of research of mine. and I, uh, Self-serving, you know, people get to listen in on our conversation. But like if you and I were at the bar and we we're having drinks, that would be one of the questions I would ask you. So I, you know, I had this fight all the time when I was at Cloud Passage because the moment you say agent and cloud, it's it's like this unholy combination. No, you can't put any sort of agent on a cloud instance because you'll take away my ability to process workloads, or I have valuable uh, you know valuable cycles to account. And that really forced every single vendor that had an endpoint you know, an agent of some sort to say, oh, no, but it's a lightweight agent. It's okay. Everyone to the point says where that. <laughs> lightweight, lightweight didn't mean anything anymore. You know, very small footprint. You hardly notice it. That's right. I, I think there is still a lot of value, and for the most part, it's, it's necessary in some cases. Like for 
uh, a lot of advanced forensics or incident response activities. Having an agent sitting there intercepting sys calls, you're not going to get that with uh, a WMI remote connection because it's very ad hoc or scheduled. It's not constantly monitoring. And I've seen that technology transfer into um, web applications as well. And vendors uh, have been producing agents for some time, actually, that do exactly what you said, but for web applications. And I think that's something we don't often talk about here in the show, or we haven't... Uh, I wanted to get into in our last interview, but we ran, we ran long. Have you seen some of that technology? What are your thoughts on it? I, you know what? I haven't, but I haven't really been looking either. Uh, my focus over the last year and a bit has been... IP, DNS infrastructure, and uh, just tracking malicious actors and adversaries. So I haven't, you know, I remember what I was covering when I was an analyst, and I still kind of keep up on some of that, but uh, I'm not really blazing new trails of, of research in terms of product vendors and capabilities of web stuff. Yeah, so what is it that you do? I mean, a lot of us know OpenDNS because we use them for, for DNS, right? And there's a lot of add-on services and benefits to doing that, but what was uh, what attracted you to OpenDNS and what is your, your daily job like there? Well, the, the main thing that attracted me here was the ability to grow a team. And the team that was here was solid. Uh, when I started here, they were seeing 60 billion DNS queries per day. That's now upwards of 75 billion across 24, 25 data centers around the world. So that amount of data wielded or using uh, threat models and analytics to try and pick off uh, new and emerging threats or you know, a botnet and how far it extends to different IPs or domains around the world. It's, uh, you know, there's just so much data to play with. It's, it's a big playground. And I've been able to build the team quite a bit. Uh, I believe we're at 12 now of researchers and analysts. So it's, you know, it's getting, it's getting big, but we still need, you know, I'm still hiring like crazy. That's cool. So what is your team focused on at, at, at OpenDNS? A so everyone we hire has really a different specialization. Uh, it's really three silos. One would be more of a classic uh, security expert with a slant towards reverse engineering, malware hunting, um, actor tracking, and campaigns. The next one is more of a classically trained software engineer that can build systems, but also has a some knowledge of data science. And then there's the data scientist or quant, uh, which still makes me giggle whenever I say it, that is you know focused on the analytics and the, the more of the, the deeper math and trending of patterns and all the bumps in the wires. So in a, a lot of that is just based on DNS traffic, right? Because you're providing DNS to so many people, you can look at all that data and surmise certain things? Well, yeah. So DNS, IPs, uh, autonomous systems. So we recently acquired BGP Mon. So we've, uh, you know, we're very familiar with BGP and just tracking all the different points. We've added who is, uh, Great big who is database. So now you can go in and pivot based on the registrant information and all of the different name server information. So it's not just DNS. There's a lot of byproducts of using DNS. And we also have proxies and sinkholes. So we can gain a lot of insight into a lot of different types of traffic. And now that security research that you're doing, Andrew, and your team, is that being funneled like back into open DNS or shared with the community or a, a little of both? Combination of both. Uh, we're very big on releasing open source tools. Uh, the most recent example is Open Graffiti, our 3D visualization engine that uses graph theory and um, just to map like data. Anything that's loosely related, we presented that at Black Hat last year, and we really use it in a lot of our blog posts and uh, 
and other presentations that we do just to visualize data for people that are sick of looking at just rows and rows of log files or CSVs. Mm. Well, but great. yeah, all of our research funnels back into our our production clusters and then gets enforced uh, using the umbrella product or can be searchable. So you can search our entire corpus of data through investigate, which allows you to take a look at those, you know, the 80 billion queries or 75 plus billion queries per day that we see. So what, what types of malicious activity, like do you have some uh, specific examples of a particular case or strains of malware that you're detecting? There's all, you know, lately we just had a, a, a researcher meeting this afternoon just to catch up and we're seeing a lot of angler and dire lately. Uh, so we're, you know, we're able to differentiate between what an exploit kit, what a lander, what a redirector, what a spam run looks like, just based on all the different types of traffics and how it ebbs and flows. And now you primarily provide OpenDNS as a free service. Are there like um, premium options? So we actually uh, made the switch to more of an enterprise security company uh, a couple of years ago. Uh, anyone can use OpenDNS. You just point your DNS at us. But if you want to do content filtering or more granular, uh, granular control over how your users are going out to the internet, then you can buy like the home premium, and then you get up to the the enterprise models. Um, it, as you can tell, they keep me separate from mm -hmm. the pricing and stuff. Mm -hmm. But, which, which is good. Uh, but then there's, you know, the platform model, which is that the all you can eat will protect all the users using uh, behind your DNS or behind your perimeter. There's also the roaming clients. So if you're back at Starbucks or whatever, you still get all of that uh, same protection as if you were sitting behind the firewall without having to backhaul all your traffic. Just use our any cast IPs and it automatically tags you as a customer. But then you also get access to the investigate and the investigate API so that you can enrich your data or help with any sort of investigations that you might be doing. So now with investigate, for example, so are you actively as OpenDNS determining what's bad or do you also have relationships with other organizations to help you kind of determine what's bad? Yeah, we so we ingest like pretty much every company out there now, we ingest uh, threat intelligence feeds from a number of different partners, run them against our whitelists because, you know, if anyone's ever looked at a threat intel feed, yeah. they've probably seen google.com in there at some point or CNN and thought, oh, okay, well, I should probably not put that in there. So we do a lot of due diligence on those third party feeds, but we also, uh, you know, like most of the, forward-thinking security vendors in the community, we're all part, all of our researchers are parts of different trust groups. So we share a lot of information uh, with one another on new campaigns and new IOCs that pop up and how we can block stuff. So it's, it's a combination of ingesting what's already out there. And to be honest, a lot of it is commoditized now. So it's, we're actually going to go through an exercise of uh, figuring out the efficacy of all the feeds and see how much overlap there is because I suspect there's quite a bit of overlap. Mm. And uh, I, I would say that the majority of our our good intelligence comes from our uh, our threat models that we build on the data and our relationships with other organizations like certs and uh, trust groups. So now, does the, your investigate uh, product, does that allow people to tap into your threat intelligence feed to then integrate that into other products or integrate that into, like, my environment that I'm protecting? Yeah, we're not really a feed, and we don't want to just be yet another feed. Mm -hmm. I think I was talking to Rick Holland at Forrester, and he's tracking 25 enterprise feed companies now, which is kind of crazy. Uh, but what we have is through the API – you can throw individual domains or IPs, ASs, or emails, and then get all the information we have on that feature 
throw them back at you. So it's just a REST API. Mm -hmm. uh, you can also do bulk queries of you know, like 10,000 domains or 10,000 IPs at a time and get the information back as to whether it's benign, bad, or, or just unknown. Because it could be on the fence, maybe no one's seen it before. But you'll see the global traffic volumes of everyone querying for that domain. Yeah, I've, I've noticed a, a lot of products, and sometimes it's surprising to see what kind of product it is, but they all are like, oh, yeah, and we integrate with a threat feed. And that seems to be a trend. Is that something you see continuing? Is it going to come to fruition at some point? It's kind of table stakes now. It's well, If you think 10 years ago when everyone started popping up and saying, oh, well, you know, we have an API that we expose now, people don't really talk about that so much because it's just expected. Right. I think integration with threat intel feeds or the ability to consume threat intel from whatever you want to use is starting to get to that point where mm -hmm. it's just expected. Uh, how can people use threat intelligence feeds more effectively? I get asked that question a lot. People are like, you know, I've got all this stuff going on in my network and they feel like if I go to a threat intelligence feed, they can help me like identify the stuff that's really bad. And that's a way to weed through the millions of events that I'm seeing in any given day. Well, it's, it's really the, the story or the, the adage of finding not a needle in a haystack, but a needle in a pile of needles, because you're getting all these indicators that likely mean nothing to you. So one of the biggest failings of threat intel feeds that I see is applicability to a specific company plus industry vertical plus geographic location plus company size. These aren't really things that companies take into account. And you're not going to get that from opportunistic scans of honeypots or you know, a fancy attack map. That's yeah. just showing you that you know, someone's running a lot of Nmap scans. Yay. So now I'm safe because I've subscribed to that feed. That's, that's not really that uh, effective. Yeah, you have to correlate that data with other data that you have and somehow make sense of it all. Yeah, it, it's, another, it's another database, for lack of a better data store, that you can plug your smarter tools into. So your SIMs, your uh, any sort of threat tracking tools, some of your information sharing tools. Mm -hmm. It's having those feeds on their own are only so useful. And if you just start looking at them as you're pulling them in, and now people aren't really doing a lot of deduplication either. They're just sucking them all in. So they've got all this redundant data that is just sitting there taking up space. Granted, disk space isn't as expensive as it used to be, but it's still kind of a pain to, to store and parse. Now, Andrew, you said that SIMs are smarter tools. That isn't always the case, in my experience. <laughs> you must have been listening to me talk about ArcSight last week. <laughs> I wasn't naming names, but... <laughs> Rhymes with Mark site. Well, it's one of those things that I, you know, I truly believe that SIM is now getting broken up into multiple areas, and I think we kind of lump it all into one. And I certainly think there's a lot of different areas. Like, where where do you see SIM going, and what are some of the different areas within SIM that you think are worth talking about? You know, I've so I worked for a SIM company. I was at Q1 Labs uh, long before it was IBM. So I. It was almost a, a holy war amongst vendors and customers of what SIM was the best. And it got to the point where they all pretty much did the same thing. It was just how fancy was the dashboard and, you know, can, it, can I send this unknown product log at your device and index it? And that's pretty ubiquitous now. Um, the, the real challenge, though, is tuning. We every every vendor used to say, you know, just put it in your data center and turn it on. And you'll see events immediately. Like, yeah, you'll see events immediately, but that's like putting a firewall in and putting a, a cleanup rule that blocks absolutely everything. You're going to see a lot of events, and you're also going to get a lot of pissed off customers. It's the same thing with SIM. You know, there there's only so many people in the world that know how to tune a SIM and they're not going to stick around for free at your site helping you configure it. You know, they want to be paid to do that. 
And that's what a lot of the sim vendors count on is that $2,500 to $5,000 a day on-site engineer to get it tuned to a point. But it's not the kind of product that is, you know, okay, it's all set up now. I don't have to worry about it because new things emerge and the stock rules aren't going to cover every angle that you need. Well, yeah, so, and your environment changes every minute, yeah. right? Because someone spun up something new, new applications happen all the time. Because yeah. I'm, you know, here's a great example. Uh, Western Digital Cloud hard drives that sync up to the Western Digital Cloud. You think there's a lot of sims that have specific rules or the ability to track that kind of communication? Or the or that it's normal. They just say, "Yep, yeah, it's going to uh, Western Digital Domain. Everything's cool." Mm. Well, yeah, you know, I think a lot of people got Sim, got it installed, got it tuned, and it's sitting there running. And they're like, "Yeah, that's great. It's collecting a lot of stuff, and we got another couple of years in this product." But I really need to reach into it to get indicators of compromise and, and get all this new fancy stuff. So now I'm going to look at this other vendor. So I'm going to go buy their product and I'm going to make it read from their SIM and I'm going to get more of what I want, like indicators of compromise. Yeah, I, yeah. See, I see that a lot today. Well, there's a lot. There's a big push for sticks and taxi support in every product now. Like, oh, can I, do you guys talk sticks? And 10 years ago and nobody really did mm. and now everyone needs to because people have said yeah this is this is what we need open ioc was so great but uh it's vendor backed so uh, let's go with a, an open miter option uh, does anyone else have questions for andrew yeah okay <laughs> go ahead jack <laughs> Um, why are you so devastatingly... No, um, we'll get to that later. Um, do you have to have my mother on the show. She'll have to explain that. Yeah, that's it. You know, you were part of the thing there. That, that the thing. thing that, you know, the, the thing, thing with the guys. The guy thing with the guys knows. that I was on the advisory panel for. Um, uh, intelligent defense at... Um, yes. At InfoSecurity Europe, it had come to me. Uh, you had a, a very interesting talk, that, but some of the, the insight that you uh, have gleaned uh, from OpenDNS on, um, well, basically all of the stuff that we have known was going to happen with IoT stuff, uh, but you can prove it. Um, and there were some yeah. truly horrifying things that you found um, that were like, really, nobody's that dumb, and then I had to remember what people were like and said, oh, yeah. <laughs> Um, <laughs> any highlights out of that you'd like to share? Yeah, if, if you have a, a Samsung Smart TV at home or in your office uh, as a device that you use for conferences or, uh, you know, just doing work in your boardroom, you might want to consider disconnecting that from the network uh, because those things are incredibly chatty. We, we put a blog post up where we, you know, we went to Best Buy and we borrowed a TV, rented a TV for a couple days and returned it. And just turning it on, the amount of traffic without any sort of configuration other than network configuration was astounding. Uh, there were, you know, DNS calls out to Korean domains, but... Luckily, it was South Korea. It was the friendly Korea, so <laughs> nothing to worry about. Yeah, no worries. Great. But uh, what, what was interesting is when I sliced and diced the data based on demographic and uh, industry vertical, there was a surprising number of healthcare, oil and gas, government agencies that had these devices in their enterprise, and they were just beaconing out. And it's the kind of thing where everyone sits back and thinks, yeah, you know, it probably happens. Well, in looking at the data, I was able to quantify it. And it was you know, just over the 75 different devices that I was tracking. Uh, we saw somewhere in the neighborhood of, I think it was like 65,000 queries to IoT infrastructure. And that's where data was being uploaded or uh, the command and control infrastructure was located and 
these are everything from Fitbits to drop cams to Western digital hard drives to uh, smart TVs, um, water sprinklers, just all kinds of scary. And it's all. Now, hey, now, I, my water sprinkler is an IoT device. It's awesome. Yeah. Yeah. You, you, how, do you, how did you ever live without having to be able to control your sprinkler system from your smartphone? I don't understand how I lived before. You don't you, do that? You, I, you don't have a sprinkler uh, yes, system? I, you, stand uh, up, you, wait, for, no, you stand up there in your boxes with the hose and you go, get off my lawn, damn kids. <laughs> uh, I, I use a highly advanced remote control system and home automation system. It's called a wife. <laughs> <laughs> but, but Jack, that is that one's that one's a really expensive auto home yes. automation system. <laughs> Very expensive. High maintenance too. Uh, <laughs> quite quite chatty on occasions, I'm sure. <laughs> we look forward to your letters. <laughs> <laughs> hey, I have a question. So uh, Good Andrew, uh, with respect to DNS sec, um, is uh, is open DNS. I knew anything? the obscenities that start sooner or later. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, is open is is your group at OpenDNS involved in any any form of research around DNSSEC with it in terms of its adoption, uh, its growth, uh, and, and utilization, and uh, in terms of operationally, does does DNSSEC have a uh, a significant impact on 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 open DNS on on how it's had to scale and roll things out? Pretty sure that was more than one question. Uh, yeah, he was. So, <laughs> he overloaded that one. So in, in terms of research from my team, we're focused almost exclusively on tracking threats. Uh, so we haven't really been looking at adoption of DNSSEC. We do have a separate infrastructure team that manages our global network. So they are the ones that would be more involved from that perspective. Uh, I... I'm, I'll be honest, I haven't had to even think about DNSSEC since I got here, which is kind of nice. Uh, but at the moment you say that you work at OpenDNS, everyone starts asking you both recursive and authoritative DNS questions. Like, no, 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 it's not like that. So, yeah. Andrew, uh, so. I, I want to go back to the IoT thing. I'm going to ask uh, Mike's question, which is, so why do we care if all of these... <laughs> new devices are in all these corporations uh, and they're phoning home to their, you know, manufacturers or wherever. Like, what's the risk? What's the real risk for enterprises today when it comes to, to IoT? Well, so the number one risk is just the fact that these things are making it into the network. So BYOD, you know, you saw people with phones, you knew they had phones you probably didn't know that someone was bringing a drop cam into a hospital, which did happen based on a lot of the data. And I'm still trying to figure out justification for as to why that would be. Uh, same thing with a drop cam in an oil and gas company. And someone said, oh, well, maybe it's monitoring, you know, PLCs and, and SCADA equipment. And I'm like, and that, does that not alarm you that this, you know, $100 camera from Best Buy is watching over the equipment that's generating power and like well yeah i guess the, i guess that's alarming so the there's certain devices that are only alarming the very fact that they have network connectivity inside of the organization there's no controls preventing them so that's either uh it could be that the organization has no idea that they're there. It could be that they don't care because they think they're just toys and they have no adverse effect on the overall security posture. Uh, or it it could just be, I, I was hoping that it would be fringe cases initially, but it wasn't fringe cases. There's a lot of these devices that are just beaconing out over and over and over again. Um, then there's certain devices like the cloud enabled hard drives that are being plugged into highly regulated industries like oil and gas, healthcare, that, you know, who's to say what's being backed up from someone's computer at work to this cloud for redundancy so that they can access stuff at home. And what's the likelihood that they know exactly what they are backing up to that vendor's cloud? 
Well, yeah, and the, the scary part for me, uh, I'm asking you questions that I have opinions on, which I've expressed on the show, but the scary part for me is it's not just the security of these devices, it's not just the security of the traffic that's flowing from these devices between users and between the cloud, but then it's the applications, because there's sometimes, or most often than not, more often than not, a web application associated with it. There's maybe a separate API associated with it, and then there's a, a, a web browser component, and then there's a mobile application component. There's all of these points where security can just go wrong, and like you said, the organizations that know that they have these devices in their network are like, yeah, it's not a big deal. Yeah, it's a toy. And it's even worse for uh, like smart TVs because they're essentially just giant tablets with web servers on them. Yep. I always said people would start caring about the security of their TVs when I was able to break into to them remotely and put ads up on them. Then people would care. Yeah, pop up, a pop up, pop up on your TV in front of in, you know in in front of Honey Boo Boo or well. Anyway. Well, you ever watch uh, Idiocracy where there's all the ads on yeah, his TV yeah. and he's watching <laughs> Out My Balls? Apollo, you had you had something. <laughs> so, I don't do networking. I'm more of a web app kind of guy. But I have a couple of IOTs at home. I use uh, Insteon. So I have them in my bedroom. I have a hub, and I have two of them for outlets. And what happens is that like is teledildonics? Oh no, <laughs> not that, not that kind of in the bedroom. It does it's help. It's not get that me kind up. of. It's not that kind of instant on. That's right. <laughs> I will say it does help get me up. <laughs> I have him in my room because uh, I think we're a bad influence on him. We are. <laughs> he was so clean. Yeah, I know. Look at that. Such a nice had, guy. Had morals and values, <laughs> all those are just out the window. Such depraved now. people. Anyways, the reason I do that is because I like to have the lights turn on like at seven o'clock. Because you know, I hit the alarm like I don't want to wake up. You have the lights turn on all in your bedroom. Mm -hmm. Your ass is getting up. So that's what I do. Um, anyways, what I did with mine just to be a little more secure because I noticed again the Instion ones are really chatty was I put them on a separate subnet, because I use OpenWRT, separate subnet, internal only. So what's cool about it is if I'm at home on the local network, I can still access the web hub to control it and configure it, but none of the traffic leaves from those devices. Do you think consumers can do that? Should they do that? Is it effective? And is there any kind of standard to let people do that easily? <laughs> uh, yes, yes, no. Uh, <laughs> that's cool. So yeah, I think it's a great idea. Uh, I don't know that the average consumer that these products are aimed at are going to do that. And if you look at any of the documentation for any off-the-shelf IoT device, the majority of them from what I saw, and don't get me wrong, I had a ball walking through Fry's on a Saturday for six hours looking at everything that had the little Wi-Fi sticker on it. Uh, Pretty much every piece of documentation I've read for a lot of these devices say that, you know, it's not allow access on these ports out to the internet or to this server, it's allow access to the internet. That's the blanket statement. And that's partly, and I'm not sure of this, but I'm pretty sure it's so that people don't call support saying, yeah, I, I, how do I configure my router to allow this? It's oh, it oh, would oh, be a support oh, I nightmare. Know, I know, I know, I know. Oh wait, I know where you're going. Is it universal? Yes, yeah. it is. There's a oh, universal yes. solution to that problem, <laughs> <Yeah>. Andrew. <laughs> Some might say it's plug and play. Yeah. Yes, <laughs> indeed. Because no, bad no, solution. Yeah. Because <laughs> yes. nobody's doing reflection attacks with SSDP on those. Oh God! Right? Because nobody. <laughs> No, sorry. All right. Okay. Now but, that you've depressed uh, us all with yeah, that, that's my thanks, job. Jack. Yeah. <laughs> and even <laughs> talking to some vendors or some people that are thinking about getting to IoT startups, a lot of their solutions for security are it's based on either industrial control system, internet connected devices, or it's the home market. And the home market guys can never get funding because they see it as disposable technology. Like the, the investors see it as mm -hmm. disposable technology. And yet another layer of complication that you add on top of everything. Yeah, we talked about security for startups and, and some of the challenges there. And IoT is certainly a big one. So, Andrew, I don't know if you have answered the five questions on Security Weekly. Not this well, year. We're doing, yeah, all right. Well, if you have, we're going to make you answer them again. How's that? Are you Sounds ready good. to play five questions with Security Weekly? Hit me. I'm running on two hours of sleep. Why not? Excellent. Three words to describe yourself. 
devastatingly handsome Canadian. If you were a serial killer, what would be your weapon of choice? Bacon. If you wrote a book about yourself, what would the title be? Bacon. Bacon. <laughs> well, we've got we to clarify first which kind of bacon. Yeah, Canadian bacon, which is like Canadian. Don't say it's like ham because I'll reach through this. <laughs> <laughs> what are the, what are I was going to say it's not there? like bacon is kind of how I... It's kind of it's it's like ham. But it's Canadian. <laughs> in, in America, we call it ham. But There, there, we, there we are. Yes. <laughs> okay. A, an easier question. In the popular freedom game... Ham? Of ask, ham? What was that? So would it be freedom ham? It's, that, yeah. Ooh, ooh, I like ooh, that. Ooh, I'll call it bacon ooh. freedom ham from now on. <laughs> In the popular game of Ask Grabby Grabby, do you prefer to go first or second? Always first. Get it out of the way. Choose two celebrities to be your parents. Andre the Giant and <laughs> Angelina Jolie. Sure. Oh, oh yes. 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 We get a dollar every time someone says Angelina Jolie or something. But I think we'd have like fourteen dollars at this point. It's a very popular answer to that question. I don't know why. But Andre the Giant was an excellent. Andre the Giant was different. No one has ever answered Andre the Giant. That's outstanding. That's great. Now, now here's something to ruin it for you. Imagine the two of them having sex. (laughs) (laughs) Every night, right up here. (laughs) (laughs) How do you get to sleep? Uh, Well, Andrew, thank you very much for appearing on Security Weekly. We're going to take a very short break. We're going to try and mix up some cocktails for those of us in studio. And so stay tuned. We'll be right back.